<clears throat> Good morning to all of you. Uh, these are QEEE sessions on a topic called the slope deflection method in structural analysis. I had written a book on structural analysis which covers this topic. You are welcome to refer to it. This book has been published in India by Narosa. There are basically five parts to the book. First part deals with fundamentals. Second part deals with the force response in statically determinate structures. The third part deals with displacement response in statically determinate structures. The fourth part deals with statically indeterminate structures, which are more common in practice than the determinate structures. And this is done by the force methods. And part five, the last part of this book, deals with kinematically indeterminate structures, displacement methods. Now, the topic we are studying today, slope deflection method, belongs to this fifth part. These are the various chapters. We are now going to go into displacement methods. But before that, let's step back and take a look at what we are doing. What is structural analysis? As you all know, structural analysis is all about finding the response of a given structure when it is subject to some loading. Now, we are actually dealing with a model of the structure. And in basic structural analysis, we deal with skeletal structures. Skeletal structures are structures made up of line elements like beams and frame elements and truss elements and grid elements. And these are subjected to different types of loads. The loads are commonly direct actions, but you can also have indirect loading. For example, support settlements, constructional errors, <coughs> environmental loading. But the direct actions are due to forces that are directly applied to the structure. And the response that we are interested in is has two parts to it, the force response, typically bending moments, shear forces, actual forces, support reactions, and the displacements, which are the deflections <coughs> and slopes and so on. The structure itself is modeled with two parts to it. One is the structural elements, and the other is the joints that connect the elements and the boundaries which are called supports. The elements typically are space or plane frame elements, grid or beam elements, and space truss elements or plane truss elements. And the joints are typically modeled as rigid joints, pinned joints, and occasionally as semi-rigid joints. These are idealizations. Similarly, supports are modeled as being either fixed or guided fixed or hinged or roller or you could have spring supports, the most generic kind of supports which are called elastic supports. It's important to, to deal with a structure that is stable. So we have to first check the stability of the structure. Is it stable or is it unstable? Only if it is stable, it is capable of resisting loads uh, without deforming into a mechanism. And if it's indeterminate, it's good to know what is the kind of indeterminacy, what's the degree of indeterminacy, static or kinematic. Actually, this is a good indicator of whether it's better to do the force method of analysis or the displacement method of analysis. So if the static indeterminacy is low, the force method of analysis is a good method to do. If the kinematic indeterminacy is relatively low, the displacement method of analysis is good to use. Now, in basic structural analysis, we make some assumptions. We assume that we are dealing with linear, static, deterministic analysis. As you advance, you will come to uh, do nonlinear dynamic probabilistic analysis. And our concern here in today's session is with kinematic indeterminacy, 
displacement methods. So basically we have two categories of methods, force methods and displacement methods. On the left side you see the different types of force methods, we are not going to look at them today. And on the right side you have slope deflection method, moment distribution method, Kani's method and the stiffness matrix methods. Broadly, you have to look at the type of indeterminacy. It is static indeterminacy in the case of force methods and kinematic indeterminacy in the case of displacement methods. There are some unknowns. The unknowns are displacements in displacement methods. The unknowns are forces in force methods. And to solve these unknowns, you need governing equations. The governing equations are equilibrium equations in displacement methods, whereas they are compatibility equations in force methods. And basically, the equations are formulated by using a stiffness formulation. You get a stiffness matrix in the displacement method. And you use a flexibility formula where you get a flexibility matrix in the uh, force method formulation. Today we look at slope deflection method. It's very old. We are speaking in the year 2015, and this method was uh, discovered in 1915, exactly 100 years ago, by someone called George Maney. We will be doing three modules, two hours each. Today's module, module 1 will deal with an introduction and we start slowly, not like the way it's normally taught in uh, classes and books. We begin slowly, we deal with only unknown joint rotations and known joint rotations. We don't deal with translations, support settlements, all that we'll do in module 2. In module 2, we look at modifications to this method where we can reduce the degree of kinematic indeterminacy, especially when we have hinged supports. And we'll also look at known support settlements. And in module 3, we cover all the other kinds of problems, applications to problems with unknown joint translations known as sway degrees of freedom in addition to unknown rotations. So, in module 1, we do a quick overview kinematic indeterminacy, flexural stiffness measures. We do the basic derivation of the slope deflection methods without chord rotations and we look at fixed end moments. We do simple problems of beams and frames with known and unknown joint rotations and we'll see how we can take advantage whenever there is symmetry in the system. So let's begin with a broad overview of what we are doing. You see here on the screen two pictures. One is a typical continuous beam on the left side and the other is a plain frame on the right side subjected to uniformly distributed loads. What is our objective? Our objective is primarily to draw the bending moment diagram, the shear force diagram, find out the support reactions. In the case of the plane frame, we also may want to find the actual forces in the members. So let's take a look at a typical beam. If you pull out the beam, you take a subsystem from the main system and you isolate it, then you have to ap apply the appropriate boundary conditions. Typically, you have <coughs> end rotations, and so it is appropriate to model them with elastic rotational spring supports. And you put some unknown end moments there, you have some reactions that you don't know. At the end of the day, what you need is the bending moment diagram and the shear force diagram. If we know the unknown n moments, then the problem is solved. So, really speaking, it's a question of finding the unknown n moments in every beam or column element. Let's take a simple case of a prismatic continuous beam, two span ABC. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I want your answer. Look carefully at that beam. It's a symmetric beam, uniformly loaded, total load is W. To span, can you tell me what the support reactions are? R A, R B, R C. Just tell me what is R A. Can we get some replies? Let me help you. This is a standard question we ask students, and some of them come up with this answer. All equal. W by three, W by three, W by three. Right or wrong? Some people say wrong and they say the middle support will take more load and they come up with another answer 
middle support takes twice as much load, so it's w, w by 4, W by 2, W by 4. Which of these two answers is correct? Okay, let's see the justification for the second answer. If you take the two beam elements, and that's a deflected shape, and separate them out, you'll find that each half of that beam segment is loaded with W by 2. And obviously, these are statically determinate and you get reactions W by 4. And in the middle, the two W by 4s will add up to a W by 2. So, is this answer correct? If not, why not? Okay. The answer is not correct for a simple reason. The simple reason is the problem is statically undeterminate, indeterminate, because you have three reactions of which the two extreme ones, RA and RC, have to be equal due to symmetry, which takes away your moment equilibrium equation. And you're left with a single remaining equation of equilibrium, RA plus RB plus RC is equal to W, sigma Fy equal to 0. And that's not enough to find the unknowns. That's one argument. The other argument is, if you look at the two deflected shapes, one on the left, and the one on the right, you will notice that there is a difference. The one on the left is the correct deflected shape. The one on the right has a problem. The problem is, in the span A, B, you have a rotation at B which is anti-clockwise. And on the right side, you have a rotation which is clockwise. And uh, compatibility demands that you can have only one rotation theta b, either clockwise or anti-clockwise. In this case, it should be 0 because of symmetry. And that means something is missing there. And what is missing there is, an, is a moment, a moment m, a hogging moment m, which must necessarily come in to make the two rotations have the same sign and be exactly equal. The moment you bring in that rotation m, you are going to get additional reactions. You can see very clearly to satisfy equilibrium, the reactions in the middle will go up by m by l, and the ones at the two ends will go down by m by l. And so, if you add up these quantities, you will find that both these answers are wrong. The middle reaction will exceed w by 2, the end reaction will be less than w by 4. And you can analyze this problem by any of the methods, and you will find the moment is wl by 16, and you can solve this problem once you have that. Okay, so, this is just an introduction to tell you that you need to understand the importance of equilibrium and compatibility in solving such problems. Indeterminate structures can have multiple solutions. You can have any set of reactions, for example, in the previous problem, all satisfying equilibrium. But they have to satisfy equilibrium. So, one requirement is you must satisfy equilibrium of forces. And for a planar structure, that would mean for every free body and for the overall structure, sigma fx equals 0, sigma fy equal to 0, and sigma mz equal to 0. This ensures the number of available equations. It's then that you need to satisfy also compatibility, as for example, the rotations being equal in the previous example. Here, for example, theta b has to be the same in the two segments. And to do that, you have to look at how much they will deflect. And there, the, uh, the stiffness or flexibility of the beam elements come into play. So, we call this the force displacement relationships. As you can see in a simply supported beam, the amount of rotation depends on Ei by L. Ei is the flexural rigidity of the beam, and L is the span of the beam. So, E brings in the stress-strain material relationship. We assume it to be linear elastic. So, all this has to be satisfied. And if you have a structure which is stable, then you can be very sure that that solution which satisfies all these three conditions, equilibrium, compatibility, and force displacement relationships, will be the correct solution, the unique solution.
Now we will look now into the topic of uh, of displacements of uh, kinematic indeterminacy. I will first look at a truss though the truss is not included in slope deflection method. It is a simple truss. You have in this case uh, 11 members, you have 3 reaction locations and you have 7 joints and it satisfies a simple truss requirement of m plus r equal to 2j. Now at every joint you can apply forces and typically we use a Cartesian coordinate system and we say in the x direction you can have one force, in the y direction you can have another force. Uh, so, you have F1, F2 all the way F9, F10 at all the joints and you can also have forces at the reactions. So, these are called external forces, some of them are reactions, some are loads. You also have internal forces, there are as many internal forces as there are members. So, in this case Ni stands for the internal force in the ith member. Fj stands for the external force at the jth node. And now we look at the same truss and see its deflected shape. Okay, all the members will be straight and uh, you have as many displacements as there are joints into two. You have horizontal deflections D1 D and vertical deflections D2. And so you have another set of unknowns deflections which are at the joints dj and you also have deformations which are changes in length in different members which we call elongations ei. So, if you have all this information, if you know everything about fj, ni, dj and ei, you have got the complete force and displacement response in the truss. Now, some of these quantities are knowns and the others are unknowns and the whole must satisfy compatibility conditions. And you can bring in restraints, for example, at the support locations you have D12, D13 and D14 equal to 0. If you arrest those degrees of freedom, the remaining degrees of freedom are 11 in number and that is the basic definition of kinematic indeterminacy. So, it is very simple in a truss, if a joint can move in 2 perpendicular directions, then you have 2 degrees of freedom at that joint. And if you add up all the degrees of freedom at all the joints and eliminate the restrained degrees and eliminate the restrained degrees of freedom, you, what you add up is called n. What happens in a beam? Let us take a look at this beam. Okay, this is a non-prismatic beam. You have three elements A, B, B, C and C, D, E, 